All right, uh, let's continue with the session. Um, so where we left off, I had described two of the three uh, approaches for doing accelerated computing. We had the uh, libraries and we had the directives. And libraries were the kind of most uh, straightforward and easy to use. They offer high quality implementations of common things, but are not that flexible. They have a set, set number of things that they can do that are relatively well-defined mathematical operations. Directives allow you to target particular loops in your application um, and identify a way for the compiler to expose the parallelism to the hardware. So you don't have to know anything about the specific low-level programming languages or models that are used for the GPU. Of course, having some familiarity with that will benefit you, I think. So if you decided to use OpenACC as your programming model, it would still, I think, behoove you to learn CUDA, for example, learn CUDA C or CUDA Fortran, uh, because uh, in order to do, in, in doing so, you would learn a little bit more about the architecture and how, uh, how work is mapped to an architecture. So it certainly benefits you to do so, uh, but you're not required to do so uh, for OpenACC, you, uh, and you can still get a reasonably high performance implementation. Programming languages are for maximum flexibility, right? So you have some workload that either is not easily exposed as a sort of loop that can be parallelized well by a compiler, or you want to control how that parallelism is mapped to the hardware because you think that you can do a particularly good job for that work. Now, uh, this is not a trivial thing to do. Um, it is very possible to get this wrong, I would say, uh, because GPUs are complicated, right? In fact, any modern um, processor hardware is complicated, but GPUs are complicated and the performance on GPUs is complicated. So do not assume that on day one, you will be able to write a code that is, can kind of achieve that seven teraflops a second the GPU potentially exposes. But it's also not hard, I would say. Um, CUDA is not, for example, a very hard language to learn, just requires some time and practice. Um, so this is a, a kind of overview of different, what the different programming languages are that are available for working on GPUs. Um, of course, we have bindings in the standard HPC languages, C, C++, and Fortran. Um, and uh, those are actually exposed in a couple different ways. Um, CUDA is the, the NVIDIA um, under like kind of framework for our architecture for doing GPU computing. And so CUDA directly has bindings in CUDA and Fortran, which is called CUDA Fortran, and then C, C++, which is called CUDA C++. Um, and of course, we've already talked about OpenACC and OpenMP as examples for, for that. Um, but also, uh, uh, CUDA has been built into other programming languages at a lower level. So for example, if you're using, if you're familiar with Python and you like using NumPy, um, there's a, a library called Numba, which can be used to uh, accelerate loops in Python on GPUs. And then there's also another library called CuPy, which can be used to um, accelerate uh, specific types of like matrix type operations on GPUs. And so you can often write, for example, in, in raw Python and make some minor tweaks to get that accelerated on GPUs. Um, there's also GPU implementations of other uh, packages like Julia or MATLAB, if those are the sorts of things that you prefer to use. Um, so here's an example in C uh, for the CUDA implementation in C for how you'd parallelize some work on the GPU. So on the left, we have our serial implementation. Again, we're coming back to the Saxby operation. And what we have is our interface where we're given uh, vectors x and y, and we have a set the length of the, the arrays and also this scaling operation for the ax plus y. In C code, in serial C code, you typically just write this as a loop, i equals zero to n, and then you just implement your a times x plus y. And then this is how you call it on the CPU code. Uh, on the GPU code here on the right in green, uh, are all of the modifications you have to make to this code, to this piece of code to make it work effectively on GPU. And so the main conceptual difference with a low level programming language like this is that you have to identify how to target the, the parallelism on the GPU to the work. So whereas in a, an approach like OpenACC, you would put a directive on top of this loop and the compiler would figure out how to do that. Uh, in this code here, you have to explicitly identify what thread on my device does what index in the loop. So what we've done is we've used some bit of CUDA syntax here, which tells you how to identify a unique thread in the hierarchy of threads that are available to you when you spawn work on the GPU. And then we're picking a particular index in the loop and we're mapping this thread to this index in the loop. So we are assigning parallelism to the work explicitly. We are now in control of that uh, rather than the compiler doing that for us. Two other bits of, bits of different syntax are that we now have to use this syntax here with triple chevrons to launch work on the GPU. I won't go into too many details about what this means, but essentially if you multiply these two numbers together, 
that says how many threads respond on the GPU to do parallel work. So you can see this is actually quite a large number of threads. And that's very typical for um, GPU programming. You're spawning a very large number of threads, ideally hundreds of thousands or something in that ballpark to do parallel work. And then the other piece of change that we make is that we add this keyword, this attribute, uh, global, which is the CUDA syntax for basically saying, this is a function that can be launched to do work on the GPU. And then inside of it, we can uh, expose work uh, to parallel threads. Um, so CUDA uh, C is actually really CUDA C++, and so uh, you can use CUDA C++ for traditional C code in most cases, but it's really much more powerful than that for those of you who are C++ developers. And so a lot of um, very uh, more modern C++ functionality is available uh, on GPUs. Uh, probably the most popular example today is that you can do uh, define Lambda functions uh, in C++ code that can then be captured and run on GPUs. And so this is the, fun the fundamental uh, piece of technology that's underlying, for example, Cocos uh, and Raja, which are two of the big performance portability layers that are being developed by DOE. So the idea is that you identify a, a, a chunk of a loop, a loop iteration right, with an index, you capture that uh, in a Lambda, and then uh, the, the underlying library, the performance portability model, does all the work of distributing that work across parallel threads, right? So you get kind of, kind of the same effect you would get from using something like OpenACC, OpenMP, where somebody else figures out how to map work to the hardware, and your job is to tell the, the, the interface how much work do you have to do, and then for each element of the work, what is the thing that you want to do? Um, and so this is an example of like templated C++ code um, for a functor or a class where you could uh, do similar types of operations on that. And so this is very expressive and it's not fully featured. There are certainly some C++ things you cannot do. Uh, and the, because of the way CUDA is architected, um, there's, there's limitations on this, but a lot of modern C++ can be done in, um, in CUDA C++. One question? Yes. So what's the big difference between OpenACC and, let's say, Cocos? When would you use what and why? Um, I can give a couple different answers to that question. Um, the practical answer, like the, the political or practical answer to that question might be that um, OpenACC and Cocos are developed by different entities that have different goals. So OpenACC is primarily a vendor-supported um, functionality, so like uh, NVIDIA slash PGI implement OpenACC, um, Cray has implemented OpenACC in the past, GCC now implements OpenACC. Um, and so that's really a community vendor supported thing that, ha that is quite generally expressive and targets specific loops. Um, but it's not necessarily the right approach for complicated pieces of work or ones that use, for example, advanced C++ features. Um, although you can do C++, for example, on these approaches. Um, Cocos is developed within DOE. Uh, as an example, and is really developed in particular by Sandia primarily, although they have collaborators at plenty of other labs, including NERSC and Oak Ridge. Um, and they are targeting problems of interest to DOE. So for example, um, they, their kind of fundamental workload, the thing that they care most about is kind of unstructured mesh problems that, or, un, or that, that's really where it got starts, like for example, in the Trilinos library at, at Sandia. Um, and then they kind of built up from that. And so they, they have, pieces of work, like for example, multidimensional loops that um, are really targeted to work well for kind of typical DOE problems of interest. Um, and that means they do some things very well and then some things are not part of their, what they try to achieve. Um, and the other thing I would say is that um, they, so that gives DOE some control, right? It gives the community control over like how this works. Uh, and Cocos is implemented on, on many major backends and they work closely with the vendors to do it. Um, so I would say, you know, both have their strengths and like one is, I'm not gonna say one is obviously better than the other, but um, you might consider using OpenACC um, for very simple for loops, you know, C style or, uh, or simple Fortran loops uh, where you want maximum ease of implementation. Cocos is much more high powered. It gives you really complicated or really advanced controls over like memory layouts and, uh, disp and work implementation. Um, but requires more work, right? It's complicated C++ code, takes some training to figure it out, so there's a trade-off there. 
And the, the one other thing that I would say is different is that Cocos has built an ecosystem around it. Um, and so, for example, they have a product called Cocos Kernels, which is basically an implementation of various uh, traditional uh, high performance computing math operations like matrix multipliers, for example, that can be portably run on any architecture. So you can have that one interface uh, that can then run in multiple places, right? Where, whereas if you're using like BLAS on, um, uh, on some system, you Often, you can just link against a different library and then get it right. But for example, like with Kublas, you have to actually do some changes to your implementation. You have to write some code differently. The promise of something like that is one interface where they can take uh, control over all of the work, distributing it to the, dispatching the work to different backends. Um, so they, they both are solving similar problems, but in different ways and targeting slightly different audiences. And I'd be happy to have a conversation with any of you offline if you're curious like which approach makes the most sense for me and my code. Um, CUDA also has an uh, implementation or exposure, an API exposure in Fortran. Um, and so it works a kind of similar way where the idea is that you mark up a subroutine with a global attribute which says this is work that can be launched on the GPU. You uh, can pick out which thread you are and then do a piece of work on that thread. Uh, you launch the work using this, this CUDA syntax with triple chevrons, tells you how many threads to launch. Um, and it also, it's very Fortran-like, this interface. So you can add an attribute to an array, for example, device in this case, which basically says, allocate this on the device. So it is very Fortran-like syntax, and this was developed originally by PGI. And there is one other implementation of it uh, by the IBM XL compiler. So if you're using Summit, for example, uh, this is available to you there, too. Um, so these are all available, uh, hopefully, to... Oh, I skipped a slide, sorry, while I was answering the Coco's question. Um, so what I wanted to say is that um, one thing... I mentioned that there were limitations in the C++ uh, approach, right? And a big limitation is that a lot of STL-type objects are not available on GPUs. For example, there is no implementation of standard vector on GPUs. That does not exist. It's a very complicated piece of code. It does not map well to GPU parallelism, right? So you cannot write like CUDA C device code and then use create a standard vector inside it, right? So that is a limitation that we have to come up with clever ways to deal with. Um, one of the approaches for this is Thrust. So Thrust is a library developed um, by NVIDIA which allows you to write STL-like algorithms on GPUs. And this is very typically a host-centric approach. So you do something like, on your CPU code, create a vector. So there's APIs for host vector, which means on the CPU, and device vector, which means on the GPU. Uh, so this creates it, uh, allocates memory in both places. Um, we can do point, like we can do standard operations, STL-like operations, by getting pointers to the beginning and end of like a list, for example, or a vector. And then we can do operations like sorting on the list or copying arrays, that sort of thing. So, Often, this is the way to go if you have very STL-heavy uh, code that you just want to get started on GPUs. Um, in some cases, this will not solve every problem, right? And I have seen plenty of cases in scientific computing codes where this ended up not being a great approach, and they really had to just rework it to look more C-like, right? Um, so I can't promise that this will solve every problem. But if this is kind of the sort of thing your code does, Thrust is where you should start before determining that you need to go to some other lower-level approach. Um, and so there's plenty of documentation on all these approaches, and we have some links here, and you can always reach out to me if you want more specific uh, inform information. So I wanted to close um, with uh, six ways to Saxby, and so this is kind of a summary of the different ways that you can take this Saxby operation and then do it on GPU. So it's kind of just six different programming models that help you do this. Um, and you've seen most of these already, but this, I think, helps crystallize what are the different approaches that are available to you. So again, uh, I've already described Saxby, single precision, AX plus Y. Um, and this is, again, just how do we do this uh, on GPUs in different ways. So with OpenACC, this is a, a notional code. Doesn't, not fully worked out example, but shows you what you need to do. Or you take your serial C code, uh, you slap Pragma ACC kernels on top of the loop. Um, or in Fortran, you do ACC kernels and ACN kernels. And then that, the compiler figures out how to do the work for you. That's version one. Um, the second option was Kublas, so this is the library approach. Uh, you can basically create vectors through Kublas, allocate the memory, copy data from the CPU to the GPU, do the work on the GPU, and then copy the data back. So again, similar, same, same result, right? We started on the CPU, we allocated memory, copied to the GPU, we copied it back, but using a library now instead of the directed-based programming model. Uh, in CUDA-C, 
uh, we are explicitly targeting the parallelism to the work. So we now take responsibility and we say, this thread does this piece of work. Right? And that's something that's not particularly familiar probably to you if you're used to OpenMP for CPU threading. Right? And OpenMP, like with OpenACC, the idea is that the compiler does that work for you. Right? You don't have to explicitly do that work. So CUDA requires a little bit more buy-in from you as the programmer and as a developer, but also gives you much more flexibility because you can say exactly what piece of work I want to do target for each thing. And although I think um, there's probably a you know, community lore out there that CUDA is hard or that you shouldn't use CUDA, I don't mean to imply that. Um, I think that CUDA is very straightforward to learn, uh, especially modern CUDA. Um, be aware of Stack Overflow posts from 2010, right? The language has evolved quite a bit since then. Um, and um, so I think this is actually pretty straightforward, but also keep in mind performance portability may matter to you, right? You may want to run your code on more than just um, the NVIDIA platform. Is that me? Um, and um, that uh, may make you, force you to make some choices. Um, I, I wouldn't say that CUDA is not portable. Um, I think you can see this uh, in the case of uh, Frontier, where uh, AMD's HIP implementation uh, looks a lot like CUDA, right? And so um, uh, one of the things that I recommend is that if you want to um, prepare for Frontier, right, do well on Summit, right? Because the architectures look very similar. And so CUDA is an example where um, there is some convergence, I think, in how these programming models are being exposed on different vendors, right? You won't write CUDA on Frontier, but you might look something that looks very similar to it. And having some familiarity with how to do this kind of work, how to map work to individual cores will benefit you, uh, even if you end up using a, a more portable approach uh, like OpenACC or OpenMP. Um, so this is the thrust approach that I described. Um, you create a host vector and device vector, and you can do some operation, like in this case, we're using thrust transform to loop from the beginning uh, and to the end of the arrays, and then do some operation like two times the first one plus the second one. So these are the types of operations that you can do um, with this STL-like approach. Um, in CUDA Fortran, as I said, uh, it's very similar to CUDA C, but Fortran-like. Um, so you, you, again, you identify which threads you want to do to, with which work. You launch the kernel using the syntax. And then you can do very nice things that are Fortran-like, like basically set an array to a value. And if this is an array that's on the GPU, all of the work is done under the hood of figuring out like, how do I actually do that sort of copy, right? So the, com the compiler knows how to interpret that operation so you can do array assignments like you would in standard Fortran. Uh, and then in Python, uh, I think this is the first Python example I've given, where uh, I, I mentioned Numba. So Numba is a library for doing parallelization of loops um, or, um, or in more commonly universal function type approaches in Python. So in Python, a very Pythonic way to write um, uh, a SACSP operation would be like, or one way to write, maybe not the most Pythonic way, but one way to write it is you define your function uh, where x and y are um, arrays, are NumPy arrays, uh, and then you just do like a, um, uh, you just do an implied loop over the elements, you return a times x plus y, right? Um, and that's, you call that in Python. Um, in Numba, Numba is, its bread and butter is universal functions. So the idea is that you write it in a scalar way, and then universal functions in Python allow you to distribute that, you know, independent of rank. So x could be you know, scalar or vector, and it would work correctly. And then the thing you do is you put this decorator here, right? So this decorator at vectorize, which comes from the Numba package, says, I want to have a vectorize implementation of this code. And um, then all of the work of figuring out how to parallelize that or vectorize that is done by the, the Python runtime, by the Numba runtime. Um, the syntax is you have to give it the output that it's returning and then the inputs. And so these, you actually have to specify the data types. That's important because um, GPUs don't work well on arbitrary data types, right? I mentioned that they're primarily good at um, numerical data. And they, um, so that's why you want to be able, to, you want to be able to write operations like 32-bit floating point, 64-bit floating point, or integer data, right? You should not be typically trying to do um, string, for example, string um, uh, operations on GPUs. Sometimes you have no way around that. And we're working on better ways to do that. But like the, the bread and butter of GPUs is mathematical operations like floating point and integer math. Um, and one thing I'll point out about Numba um, is that this is not just for GPUs. And so Numba can also be used for accelerating your code on multi-core CPUs. And so um, taking the time to write, expose your code in a way that um, 
is amenable to Numba will actually be helpful to you, I think, on that too. And that kind of allows me to close, I think, with the point that Jack um, said earlier, which is that um, the work that you do to port your code to uh, GPUs will often benefit your code even where it's running now. Um, I see that time and time again. A big part of my job is to um, work with uh, scientists and porting their codes to um, uh, to run on GPUs and, and I very often see that um, people have code that they haven't profiled potentially in a long time or doesn't work well on the current architecture as well. We often find easy performance bottlenecks that help the CPU code as well as the GPU code. Of course, I always get a little bit sad when I do that because then GPU doesn't look as good. You know, it's hard for me to get paid. But, um, uh, but, but more seriously, um, uh, that's, that's a big benefit, right? Is that you, it gives you a fresh eye at your code, right? It gives you a fresh eye at the performance of your code and uh, allows you to see where your current bottlenecks are and it's often in places you didn't expect. Um, I can think of plenty of cases where um, the, it was in crazy places, like uh, a case from a hackathon last year where um, people were concatenating strings together in, um, in C and like that was the majority of their runtime for their, their data science app application. Uh, it was not at all where they expected. And so um, these types of operations, uh, this, this, this workflow of profiling your code, finding the bottleneck, and then making it faster is very generic. And I think um, one nice thing about the change to accelerated computing is forcing you to do that, right? Forcing you to take a fresh eye at your code, thinking very carefully about where the parallelism is in your code, and then how to target your work to that parallelism. It's not all roses, I would say. Um, it, sometimes, for some algorithms, it is hard to find a way to write that same piece of code in a way that works optimally on both CPUs and GPUs. That requires thought in some cases, right? For SACSP, whatever, you, you know, it's hard to get that wrong. Um, but there are more complicated algorithms where the most efficient way to write it on GPUs may not be the same as the most efficient way to write it on CPUs. And, you know, compiler directives can't solve that problem for you because it may be implicit in the algorithm that you wrote or the way that you wrote um, the thing that you're trying to do. So I don't want to pretend that there's nothing to do here, but at the same time, this is also why it's fun to be you know, a scientific computing developer, right? You get, you get an opportunity to think about how to apply your work and take advantage of modern architectures. So the story that I want to tell you is that it's easy to get on GPUs and with a little bit of care, do very well on them. Um, it takes more effort to get that peak performance, right? And sometimes it's not even achievable for your, your algorithm, but uh, good performance, great performance even, is attainable with a, a modest amount of effort. Um, and the, the GPU computing platform for all vendors has come a very long way since GPUs for scientific computing were first developed. And uh, the situation uh, is, is pretty good, I think, for developers starting out on GPUs. Um, and um, this slide, which is my last slide, kind of emphasizes that NVIDIA works pretty carefully with the open source ecosystem to make sure that this platform is as open as possible, right? And so we work with, with the open source compiler developers, like the LVM folks, the GC folks, to make sure that we are, we, there's, those approaches are supported on our platforms. Um, for example, the Clang C++ compiler can actually generate CUDA code because uh, it, there is a well-defined API into our assembler so they can generate code that can then be compiled to run on NVIDIA GPUs. And of course, the same approach applies for uh, um, implementations like OpenMP, where that is not, an, in many cases, not an NVIDIA implementation, right? So IBM has an implementation, and Clang has an implementation of OpenMP offload that is not written by NVIDIA, but nevertheless takes advantage of the fact that our tools and our API can be used to implement those things on GPUs. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to describe, that this is a, a platform that is continuing to expand um, and uh, get better. Um, and it occurs to me that I never actually introduced myself, so sorry about that. Um, I could do that better late than never. Um, so uh, I'm Max Katz, and uh, the reason I'm talking to you is, is of course, uh, my job as NVIDIA Solutions Architect, so I work with developers to help um, un them understand the NVIDIA platform and become more successful, but in, in particular, uh, I'm the uh, Solutions Architect uh, for Department of Energy, right? And so my job is really to work closely with you uh, at, at places like NERSC to make um, your job successful. And so you should absolutely feel free to reach out to me. It's my job to um, help you with your work. And I work very closely with the NERSC staff to, um, of course, on training pl uh, programs like this, but also like on more directed efforts uh, to work with your applications to make them better. Um, Okay, so that was what I want to talk about. I think we have a few minutes left. Does anybody have questions about the platform? Any, anything they want to know? <laughs>
Yes. In one of your examples, you had to specify the exact thread structure of blocks or something. And so, newbie question, could you walk through what is an SM, what is a warp, what is a thread, what is a block, and how to think about how to spread that out? You know, you just throw a gazillion threads at it, and you target it to the hardware? Uh, I certainly could do that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a slide here which would help me demonstrate that, but let me describe it verbally, and I'll do the best I can. Um, what he's asking about is that there are, there's a hierarchy of parallelism on GPUs. Um, and this is, I think, tr this is true in every um, GPU platform. For example, this is very publicly documented for AMD's GPUs that they have this. Um, and the reason that there's a hierarchy of parallelism is that modern chips are very hard to make right. And um, it is hard to make a monolithic chip with 5,000 threads, right? That, that is a very hard thing to do. You would get very low yield as a processor developer. And so the way that we GPU uh, implementers do that is we make smaller units, uh, which for NVIDIA are called streaming multiprocessors, that we can then tile across a die, essentially. So we take one unit, one fundamental compute unit, the SM or the streaming multiprocessor, and then put a bunch of them on the GPU, uh, and then they can coordinate to do parallel work. Um, and the number of SMs, or stream multiprocessors on the device, essentially determines the compute power of the device. So our lower, uh, lower end GPUs, like for the gaming GPUs, typically have fewer ones. They have less total compute power, less raw compute power. And the bigger GPUs have more of these multiprocessors. And essentially it's the same architecture, but with fewer or more, and that determines how much compute capability is available to you. Um, so that makes it easier to write, um, to build a chip that has massive amount of parallelism, to have this hierarchy of parallelism. And then that plays into like the memory structure too, where each multiprocessor has its own L1 cache, right? That is independent of the L1 cache for other um, stream multiprocessors. Um, and so it, that way you can have, those threads can communicate with each other within that multiprocessor, but cannot directly communicate with each other on the other parts of the chip. And so uh, in this syntax that we saw before in CUDA, CUDA C, um, what we have to do is specify how is our parallelism distributed across those two levels of parallelism. So the first number in the, in the triple chevron syntax is the number of teams or groups, or in CUDA speak, thread blocks. So this is, this is teams of threads or groups of threads that do work in concert. And those threads are targeted, they live on a particular multiprocessor, a particular SM. And then the second number is how many threads Per that, per that team or group, right? So this concept is also exposed in OpenACC in the concept of gangs or OpenMP in the concept of teams. Um, there are groups of threads and then that second number is the number of threads in each team or group or in CUDA speak thread block. And um, the total number of threads that you can run in a group is about a, is 1024 on a NVIDIA GPU. And then that's the highest level of parallelism at that lower level of parallelism. And then if you want massive parallelism, you have to combine many groups of threads together. That's what that second number is. So it requires a little bit more work for you to understand how to map your work to that two level hierarchy. And that's one of the nice things about OpenACC is that the compiler makes it an informed choice, a heuristic guess about how to map that work effectively. Um, so you don't have to do that. But you will probably, as a performance optimization, want to do that at some point because you will get much better performance if your parallelism is mapped well to the architecture. Um, and that is, again, a true statement across GPU implementations. It is not possible to write a, a good GPU, for the most part, um, at yield anyway. Like, Cerebros is an example of a, a vendor that has done one monolithic chip, right? But for most modern GPU implementations, um, it's like that, where you have in compute units like multiprocessors that are then tiled across the chip. So you have to be aware of that for maximum performance. Any other questions? Are we good on time? Anyone have questions online? 